Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Masha Kaufman, and I'm the director of the Brock Institute for International Peace Studies. I'm very pleased to uh, have this panel with us and to welcome again uh, Fanny Dubois to the uh, Croc uh, to celebrate the publication of this uh, book. I would like to begin by reading the first uh, paragraph of the acknowledgement. Um, during a hearty lunch, Professor Scott Appleby, sitting next uh, uh, here to me, then director of the Croc Institute for International <coughs> Studies at Notre Dame University, where I was visiting research uh, fellow, invited me to turn a lecture I gave on campus into a, a manuscript. This book is the end result. I'm grateful to Scott, as well as to the Croc Institute and uh, all the colleagues I met and worked with there for the space for reflection and stimulating conversation, a way for the early early of being in the uh, field. So it's really exciting to have uh, Fanny come here and uh, speak about this uh, book in this uh, event. And we have two distinguished uh, uh, speakers to respond to <coughs> Fanny's uh, as much as they will uh, uh, engage in uh, congratulations, there is also give it some hard time for his, uh, some critique for his uh, uh, for the book, the argument. And I'm really excited to have that. And I have one question about this uh, first paragraph that you uh, started the book with. Where was this party lunch? That you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm looking for this example. But that's too many party lunches, I think. <laughs> Once, once we figure out the place, I think we should all go there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the beginning of our next book, uh, and that's right, because this is really, uh, really an exciting opportunity, exciting book, and exciting opportunity for uh, for us. Um, a few words about uh, uh, Scott and Scott Appleby and uh, Laurie Nathan. I don't think they need the introductions uh, uh, here in our in the context of uh, our presentation, as we all know. Scott, uh, previously uh, served in his most important position as director of the Cross Institute, as you know. Now he's only a dean of the Kiosk School. Uh, and uh, uh, Lori Nathan uh, has come to us from South Africa, uh, so he's a fellow, a compatriot of the uh, uh, Sunny, and uh, he has launched our mediation program, and he's already doing remarkable work in making this uh, program uh, notice. So through research, practice, uh, training, and uh, teaching. And I'd ask uh, Fanny to uh, speak for about 20 minutes to present to us his arguments in the book, and then uh, Scott and Lori to give us some hard time of his, uh, his arguments. Thank you very much, and I look forward to this uh, <coughs> and Nathan and colleagues and friends, it's a huge privilege to be here today. I, um, needless to say, have a very deep, big debt of gratitude to the Keogh School of uh, Global Affairs and to the Brock Institute for this project that actually was conceived here. You know, after 15 years one uh, in the field, one starts to believe that you cannot write anymore because you are so rushed, so there's a different energy and so on. And to come here and to have the privilege of sitting down and reading uh, what you can read and, and, and lay your hands on was a, a game changer for me, certainly. Um, and, um, and basically what I did when I was here was to read every political theory on reconciliation that I could find, uh, simply uh, starting with Dan Forpott and then working my way through, through, through all these books. Um, and, uh, and finding it, of course, very illuminating, but gradually seeing the kind of contours and the lay of the land is coalescing around three typologies, three kinds of reconciliation theory that are out there. Reconciliation is a liberal peace, where you invite nations that are at war or in uh, periods of bad governance into the family of liberal democracies in the world. Secondly, uh, uh, reconciliation as the forgiving embrace where you act out whether at the individual level or at the national level, the sequence of the Christian notion of forgiveness, where there is repentance, acknowledgement, repentance, forgiveness, and reparation. 
That's the second big cluster. And the third big cluster is reconciliation as agonistic debate, which is a, a, a theme that has come up quite, quite strongly in recent years. When I, um, when I did my lecture on these typologies, that is when Scott uh, said, invited to me to, to revisit the, the, the case study I was most familiar with, which is South Africa, and said, reread the history of your country now, 20 years on, in the light of these three typologies, to see what you come up with. But it was interesting for me, and it was a little bit disconcerting as I read uh, these two bodies of, of, of literature, how they seemed to be drifting apart. The history of South Africa, reading the original documents produced during the time of Kodesa and other times during the TRC period, um, interviewing some of the people that were still alive at the time, uh, that were key protagonists, also reading some of the excellent histories produced on the period, on the one hand, and in reading political theory and finding that it's not necessarily illuminating the one the other, and there's a bit of a disconnect between these two thoughts. Um, if one takes the idea of liberal peace, for example, it really didn't feature a, um, front and center for the African National Congress and the National Party when they first started talking to each other. They were both nationalist movements. And so the idea of a liberal democracy was not the first idea that came into the table. Nor 12 years later, when the TRC concluded its work, uh, was liberal democracy the the big idea. Uh, in fact, the TRC got heavily criticized for its uh, amnesty provisions by liberal critics around the world. Nor was forgiveness as central as we often think. Uh, although Mandela undoubtedly uh, uh, practiced the politics of grace towards uh, his former oppressors, uh, you cannot really say it like this, that Mandela for that forgave the tap, for example. I mean, for starters, the clerk never asked for forgiveness. He never thought it was necessary. He said his hands were clean. So to then say, well, Mandela for that gave the clerk uh, is perhaps the wrong metaphor to project on that crucial relationship. And, and nor was the TRC an exercise in political forgiveness. The TRC was an exercise in public truth telling. And, uh, and our constitution was also not a document that tried to paper over the cracks, our constitution had the strong mandate for redress, not for impunity or amnesia. So when, by the time I left for home after this period at, at the croc, I had more questions than answers, like one should have after a good sabbatical. <laughs> and it was not long after that that the Mandela actually uh, passed away in, in November, December 2013. And I remember that being in the midst of this writing, how the outpouring of grief in South Africa uh, for this man, and at the same time, this very hard look at what has reconciliation achieved and not achieved for people, um, produced a kind of anxiety, kind of, I felt that South Africans were being either deliberately or inadvertently forgetful about how we in fact had made peace. There was a lot of misremembering often purely for political or for personal gain. Mandela became, owning his legacy became a hot issue on the election trail, for example, as it is indeed again now. Um, but in all of this rhetoric around reconciliation that resurfaced around Mandela's death, um, what I missed was the central voice in 1994, which was the voice of the middle ground in South Africa the ordinary South African who have always been a silent majority, but through various in, um, uh, uh, interventions during the 1990s had a chance to speak. Two million submissions, public submissions to our constitution making progress, 21,000 testimonies to the TRC, aired uh, live over radio and TV for 18 months, um, movement, trade union movements, business movements, religious movements, all being part of this process in the transitional period. And um, this voice had become quiet. And so the more, 
in favor of what I would like to call a dirty dance between the left, the so-called left and so-called right in South African politics. The more the Afrikaner right-wingers ran to Fox News here and got President Trump to, to tweet about the white genocide, the more the um, Zuma cartel and its attendant looters could say, well, I told you so. And the more Zuma and his cronies spread racial fear and resentment by describing reconciliation as no more than a ruse to white capital, the more Afriforum said, look, I told you so. So the year 2013 and the years following, even up to recently, have not been South Africa's greatest. At this point, perhaps it's important to, to say uh, what I mean by reconciliation as a metaphor for political transition. I used in the book as the political, the institutional, and the social change required to create an inclusive and fair society after war and or oppression. Inclusivity and fairness are at the heart of this. Um, but, and I'm rushing a little bit, but I want to get to the, to the, to the main point of the book, which is, is there, can we say that in this 25 year period from when the ANC and the, and the National Party first spoke to each other, all the way through to the TRC's conclusion, and even now, can we say there's one key idea that drove reconciliation right the way through? Is there a key designator in reconciliation? Some people say it is trust, should be trust. Some people say it should be uh, or sort of civic trust. Others talk about more personal trust. Others talk about respect. Others talk about fear and uh, free and fearless speech. Uh, Dan Fulpott has written a lot about the right relationship, the restoration of the right relationship as at the heart of reconciliation. For me, that key designator of reconciliation is the acknowledgement of interdependence of seeing the world for what it in fact is, namely an interdependent reality between enemies fighting. If, if and when that penny drops politically, institutionally, socially, is when reconciliation seems to be making progress. Um, I argue that reconciliation is for realists. It's not for dreamers. It's not for idealists. It's for people who have the guts to see the world as it in fact is, namely interdependent. And of course, this is the very reality that was systematically denied by apartheid and colonialism before it, that white and black South Africans were in fact interdependent. This was politically, institutionally, and socially denied. But by turning that narrative on its head, reconciliation was, the, was meant to be the antithesis of apartheid which literally means apartheid. Interdependence means the opposite of that. And I think this core idea <coughs> is what South Africa still has to offer the world now. Um, many of you will be familiar with the, the classic prisoner's dilemma of, uh, in political science, where you have two prisoners, um, but the prosecutor does not have the evidence to, to put either away. But by separating them out and making a deal with each of them, she hopes one of them will break the trust and rat on the other. But the, the, the president does not know whether his friend has done that or not. He has got to keep faith in his friend or decide to tell, to tell everything in, um, in, um, in, in exchange for more lenient service. And seems to say, many theorists say that the, the real uh, option for most people is to go with the fact of ratting out your, your friend. Now, I want to change it a little bit and say reconciliation is a bit like the courageous politics that is when you're stuck in a lifeboat with your worst enemy in the middle of the ocean, and you say to that enemy, well, we have three options. First is, I take this oar and I hit the hole in the bottom of the boat because I cannot stand being there. And then I'll swim for the shore. But there are sharks circling. You may not get very far. The second option is that you and I take each other on within this boat. And 
hand and may the strongest person win. And then we'll dump the other one over the board. Whoever is the winner will row to the shore, half into it. And perhaps that is not the smartest option. The third option is to say, I don't trust you. I don't really like you very much. Can you row a boat? <laughs> and can you row it with me towards the shore? And as we row, can we talk? And yes, perhaps we're not pulling equal weight at the beginning. Yes, there may be a lot to talk about. Uh, there may be a lot of resentment, but at least the boat is moving towards the shore. The boat is not going the other way. And so for the, the realization that we're in the same boat, that we can't, that it is self-defeating to stand up with bravado and hit a hole in your own boat to make it sink. Some, some very um, angry young <coughs> South Africans are saying, I'd rather burn the whole place down and start again. I would suggest, with respect to that anger, which I can never fully understand or appropriate as a white man, I still think it's the wrong thing to do. Because in the end, we will all have to swim for the shore. <coughs> um, let me, let me um, then try and draw this together with, with three, three final points. You see, I studied theology at one point in my life, so I have to make three points for three <laughs> points in a row. Um, what is at stake? What is at stake by designating into the, by designating some key concept in close correlation to reconciliation? What is actually at stake? Why is it important? Isn't this just hair split? Let me give you three reasons why I think it's important. And with that, I'll conclude. First of all, reconciliation processes, which I've observed where I've been privileged to work in Somalia, in, in Myanmar, in Iraq, and in South Africa, those processes have all, without, without exception, have a fragile start, an extremely fragile beginning, where it's almost inconceivable that there can be peace. And in my view, one has a better chance of, su of success in convincing parties to participate by pointing out the interdependence, the fact that they're in the same boat, then you are by preaching to them about human rights or perhaps um, you know, telling them to, to restore their relationship. The, the fact is that these parties, however angry, however dire the situation, are in the same boat. And that, that moment of truth is something that dawned in South Africa. And I think at a crucial point, when we decided we wanted to talk, but political violence was still billowing on either side, it was this realization that uh, saw people through. And I'll tell you an anecdote just to illustrate that, if I may. Uh, General Fulyun was a, was a militia leader. He was the former head of the Defense Force, South African Defense Force, retired, but he had mobilized white youth with guns ready to fight in South Africa in the year 92, 1992, 93. He was very distrustful of the fact he thought that he was being sold out at the negotiation table. So he had these militia men. And then one day, he was, his fingers were itching. He couldn't wait anymore. He employed 2,000 of these young men um, to, to prop up a stooge government, uh, excuse me, in the, in the name of uh, Mangope, which was in the Northern Cape. And during this period, when Fulun was doing that, uh, it turned out that uh, was a fiasco. It was a complete fiasco. The next morning, Mandela phoned up the plan. I phoned up for you. And I actually, I actually phoned, uh, I actually spoke to for you when he turned 80. And I asked him if he remembered this conversation. He said, yes, he remembered the conversation. And he, yes, it did happen like this. Mandela phoned him up and said to him, General, I see you had, uh, you, this happened yesterday. I want to say two things to you today. Number one, is we want to acknowledge that we cannot defeat you militarily. We cannot. The ANC is not strong enough to take you on. But General, the second thing is you cannot drive out or kill all black South Africans. We 
which means that tomorrow there will be white and black South Africans in this country together. And why didn't we learn to live together now before we destroy the cake that we're fighting over? Rather than afterwards, when the cake is much more. Well, Yoon says he took this argument to his constituency and brought the right wing into the process based on this argument, which is essentially saying we're in the same boat together. Well, Yoon, Mandela reminded you that they were in the same boat. And this was at the very fragile beginnings of the South African Peace Presidency. Well, not quite the beginnings, but in, in, it brought in a uh, very important uh, role player. The second is, during this period also, the second reason why this is important, this idea of interdependence, is because what gives negotiators the resolve to keep talking when there's growing violence on either side and when spoilers operate at random? What gives them the resolve? What makes them return to the table again and again and again, and any negotiation process that want to be successful needs to have this result of doing it over and over and over again. In South Africa, there was no different. Talks broke off, started again, broke off, started again. Every time there was people willing to talk. What drove it? Ruth Mayer, who was the chief negotiator on the, on the uh, National Party side, wrote the following. He said, um, at one point, Mandela called off the talks. And uh, there, there was a massacre of Shaq Dollars on the 22nd of June, 1992. And the ANC said it was finished talking with government, that in fact, it was cutting all ties with government. No further talks. I remember Mr. Mandela announcing this on evening television news. And I said to myself, oh, damn, here we go. All the hard work up to that point appeared to be over. It seemed everything had been done for nothing. Then a few minutes later, well, after this announcement on national television was made and Ruth Mayer was still staring at the TV, his phone rang at my home in Pretoria. Um, and it was Cyril Ramaphosa, who was the chief negotiator on the ANC side, currently the president. And I said, what the hell are you doing? And his response was, when can we talk? Mandela saying, the talks are off. Him saying, when can we talk? So this resolve to keep talking. And for the next three months, the two of us, Cyril and myself, were locked in by our principles to find a way to overcome the deadlock. We had to come up with something, and it was called the record of understanding. More recently, Maya said to me, um, that there was a saying between him and Cyril, which was basically, we can solve anything. We really put our heads to this. We can solve anything together. And these were people negotiating massive, and with massive stakes behind them. But again, it was the idea that we're in the same boat. We are in the same boat together. And thirdly, and this is the final point I will make to I don't think any South African could have envisaged how difficult the road would be since. How racism has remained prevalent in South Africa, like an ever mutating virus that sticks its head out every now and then. That inequality is still dehumanizingly high in South Africa. That the social ills that we inherited from our pocket are still with us. What motivates us to continue that fight for social change? What motivates us? Because it seems to me that we're now locked in, uh, in, in two camps, and it seems to me that people are ready to give up. Desmond Tutu had an answer when he described Ubuntu not as a fly in the sky idea about how we can all love one another, but by an expression of how socially, ultimately, we are in the same boat. Action. That made a difference to enable ordinary South Africans to embrace reconciliation. And you would have read 
perhaps some of you, Desmond's uh, the definition of Ubuntu as the very essence of being human. If, if you say somebody has Ubuntu, you're saying they are generous, they're hospitable, they're friendly, caring, and compassionate. My humanity is caught up and bound up in yours to belong in a bundle of love. So I find that actually international law has incorporated some of this in their own statute, where the idea of moral interdependence is captured. That if somebody, that if there is a crime so grievous committed in Myanmar, it is a crime that affects me. And therefore I have the duty to stand up, even if I'm not living as a direct participant in that crime, as victim or perpetrator. It affects that sense of moral interdependence sets at the heart of what Desmond Tutu describes as a virtue, that our humanity is caught up in each other. And in South Africa, I think we forgot that. As Laurie said earlier to me, we went to sleep. And it's true, we went to sleep. And we are reaping some of the better fruits now. So this reading South Africa's history through interdependence not only shows us what the progress is that we've made, but also why some South Africans, many now, are disappointed in reconciliation. Um, but while we are justified in let, feeling let down by it, I've argued, and I will continue to argue, that it is wrong to view Mandela's approach of reconciliation as the root of the problem. In my view, the Mandela concept of reconciliation with its emphasis on interdependence was abandoned too early, allowing for former and new elites to maintain and develop new forms of exclusion and unfairness in post apartheid era. It is not because of too much reconciliation that justice was not realized. It was because there was too little. And with that, I will hand over to Saul. Thank you, Tony. I'm glad that Dan is here. here. Can't help us because, as you may know, Tony's book appears in our series on strategic peace building. Dan and I are co editors along with John Paul Lederoff. And there have been a number of distinguished volumes in that series so far, and there will be others. So that's a plug for those of you who are working on manuscripts. You're open for business. I don't know what metaphor to use, whether a boat, and if I want to be nasty, say our boat is leaking as we go there. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Or the meal. Uh, but I, I guess I'll go with the latter and say I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm between the two main courses here. Um, and we'll see what happens in the final. So, Bonnie Dutrois has written a book that seems rather risky on at least four fronts. First, at this point, what can possibly be said about the South African case? The negotiations which led to the end of apartheid, the mostly peaceful transition, or at least on mostly nonviolent transition of power, and the charismatic leadership of Nelson Mandela. What can be said about all this that is new and original? Kind of a risk. Bonnie's stated purpose in writing the book was, quote, to develop a consistent yet flexible theoretical approach to political reconciliation rooted in the central idea of a pervasive, unavoidable interdependence between groups in conflict. So the answer to originality is this concept of interdependence. Do we really need a theory of reconciliation? <laughs> And even if so, why build it on a reevaluation of South Africa's transition now a quarter century after formal apartheid ended? As Fani points out, bibliographies of studies on South Africans' political change run to hundreds of pages, just a bibliography. Yet it is true, I think, that the following questions are still, with all that, in search of a compelling answer. How do reconciliation processes make a start in a context that militates against their very possibility? How do reconciliation processes broaden beyond the political elite into a sustainable political transition? To what degree and in which ways can social change be linked to political transitions? These are your questions. So yes, the risk of redundancy, the first risk is real. 
Yet the central themes of this book remain relevant, namely the kinds of relationships which reconciliation aims to restore in order to facilitate the society desired by reconciliation. What kinds of relationships are we talking about? In South Africa, for example, cru crucial political relationships enable the negotiations to succeed. They function, to use Fani's word, as a glue that held together a deeply fragile process. Was it forgiveness that did the trick, as has often been claimed, or was another relational dynamic at play? The Trois writes, in this regard, if one seeks to move beyond the popular images of whiskey-fueled late-night debates, clandestine meetings in European hotel lobbies, and messages inscribed on toilet paper smuggled from prison cells, how did these relationships, in fact, beyond those stories, work? further reconciliation at both personal and political levels. That's the first risk. Redundancy, nothing new. Second risk, treating or mistreating Mandela. Notwithstanding the fact, it was good to hear you now because it gives me a different, a different kind of understanding of your take, but I prepared this, so I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> uh, notwithstanding the fact that you dutifully do rehearse in the book the standard encomia for the great man, reciting his many remarkable and world historical virtues, this is obligatory in writing about South Africa, and you do that. How dare you take issue with the fact that in much of the popular literature, at least, quote, Mandela is presented as an exception as a leader who stood up against existing political trends, forgave against all odds, and miraculously convinced others to lay down their weapons, close quote. Later you write, undoubtedly a giant at this time, Mandela's reputation posthumously seems to have grown even larger, perhaps too much so. I added the italics to my view, perhaps too much so. <laughs> quote, and now seems to enjoy a kind of secular beatification that makes it virtually impossible for any contemporary leader to attempt to learn from him, let alone to match him. You would not be denying the great man's singularity, old chap, would you? <laughs> <laughs> his greatness of soul, his charisma. You're not denying these things, are you? <laughs> risky, Bonnie, risky. I think that's enough. Jocularity for a dean. <laughs> That's a bit of a risk. It should have been taken. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, why took it off? You even entertain the question Does a war torn nation have a Mandela, have to have a Mandela in order to make lasting peace? Indeed, by shining a spotlight on the clerk as well, you seem to answer no or at least far less controversially, a Mandela is a necessary but not sufficient condition for building lasting peace. I think we can agree with that. You're right, without the clerk, it's difficult to imagine a nonviolent end to apartheid. How did the clerk himself understand his change of heart after occupying leadership positions as Afrikaner politician from 1969? For a period that covers almost the entire duration of statutory apartheid, how did he manage to achieve a ringing mandate from the frightened and deeply skeptical uh, white minority to proceed with political risk. Uh, he evolved from being an apartheid president to a deputy president in a multiracial democracy and later into an outspoken member of civil society. These are all good questions. And you are not making clear causing a moral equivalence between the two. But in a way, contextualizing Mandela in this relationship and giving in a way credit to perhaps do credit to the clerk and to that side. The lesson of the Mandela to clerk relationship is that it conveys, as Fani notes, the sobering fact that without ensuring the conditions in which an enemy can flourish, one's own community is unlikely to prosper sustainably. Here perhaps is where we do appreciate Mandela's deep insight, his true genius, his recognition of the need to engage the enemy as a human being, and thus to afford him the grace of not holding his ugliness or the ugliness of those he represents to stand in the way of peace. A third and related risk, 
You write less about heroism in Cairo's moments in Robin Island and much more about the ordinary, grimy, and above all tedious business of politics and institution building. This is a risk perhaps mostly to your sales. <laughs> when all the world leaders have left the stage, when the great man has resigned and then passed finally from the stage, you argue that the real work has only begun. At least you do have a silver bullet. But this interdependence, which you claim to be the key to sustainable coexistence, this element which transcends the South African case and arguably applies to other would-be political transitions, has to be worked out, planned, cultivated over time, and through several adjustments, experiments, and economic mechanisms. Interdependence, as you detail it in the rest of the book, beyond the kind of the framing we're doing here, as you get into the kind of nitty gritty of what interdependence means on a week to week, month to month, year to year basis, does not blossom like a flower as each soft spring recurrent. It is not natural, especially to a society that has struggled for so long with dependent and subordinate castes or classes in one privileged set of Brahmins. So, on one hand, we can speak very poetically about interdependence. But it's not particularly poetic stuff. It is day to day, year to year working to recognize interdependence, but also to make it more of a reality than in fact it has been in the past. You write in this regard if the inception of South Africa's reconciliation process depended crucially on political leadership, okay, then its subsequent enactment and sustainable moves toward a new future depended, <coughs> depended equally crucially on the range of platforms, mechanisms, institutions, organizations, and initiatives that emerge in its name. Arguing that reconciliation is morally or strategically desirable is one thing, but to convince a divided nation that is actually possible and practically workable, that's quite another. And it was this burden more than any other that a range of transitional institutes in South Africa, Africa carried as they set to put reconciliation into practice in a country that had never before experienced black and white citizens working together in intentionally reciprocal and mutually beneficial ways, close quote. In other words, the process is emphasized here and the institutionalization of the process. Before we leave this, let us say that with the references to the most recent South African period and its terrible leadership, whatever processes may have been in place, and I know you're not saying this, we, count this, we cannot discount the absolute continuing importance of effective moral leadership. And South Africa is in a crisis as a result of the lack thereof. So uh, let me um, go to the fourth and final question, or, or I'm sorry, risk that has been taken. And that is fourth and finally. You risk application beyond stuff. We haven't talked about this much at all yet. But the book is not really just about South Africa. The original idea was to focus on South Africa, and as Lonnie mentioned, to reread its history in the light of what's happened since and revisit the question a quarter of a century later. But it's really much more ambitious than that. It's about whether the South African case and how applies to many other cases of political transition and whatever we end up calling reconciliation. So this is risky. You move beyond South Africa, and where's the first place you go? Israel, Palestine. <laughs> Glutton for punishment. <laughs> so many possible objections to this move are obvious. The fundamental differences of conflicts waged in very different contexts dragging behind them very different histories. Historians, masters of detail and non-transferable nuance, <laughs> tend to disdain comparisons. They worry about this haiku, how the whole perception moves from rule into exception with the one tiny detail I miss. That's not a haiku, but it's close enough. <laughs> so this is a risk, the comparative tag. <clears throat> It's a risk because conflicts, while we can generalize about them, are very different. And one can very easily gloss over those differences. So you cite as a reason for South Africa's ongoing relevance the fact that the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, where you, you've worked for so many years in such good ways, 
and other institutions are called upon to engage scores of places where people seek answers to their own vexed questions on political transition, reconciliation, transitional justice. In these engagements, as you point out, sure accurately, the merits and, demer and demerits of the South African case are often debated by key decision makers with pressing concerns. How to make a start to reconciliation? How to sustain its momentum and extend its reach beyond the political elite? How to deliver against the inevitably high expectations associated with it? And yet, does it do, in the end, to reduce the dazzling particularity of any one case to a process? however fluid and adaptable, that produces either the realization or the fact of interdependence. Is that what it's all about, a process? I say yes and no. So yes, the process is, is worth studying, but I'm not so sure that you've convinced us that that, that alone does it. I'm coming to the conclusion. With all these four risks, I credit you with taking these risks to draw us closer to answers to questions peace builders continue to struggle with. What kind of reconciliation is relevant and therefore able to guide political leaders entangled in the midst of the immediate aftermath of violent conflict? What kinds of arguments about reconciliation, this is from Fani, this question, what kinds of arguments are taken seriously by idealists and realists alike in places where people with guns remain fully prepared to kill for a cause, but where ordinary citizens and some far-sighted leaders are beginning to seek a new ethos to overcome enmity. Or to use Brock's feet, how to balance the moral imagination and the political imagination. How to inform one with the other. How does that get translated? So, these are the kinds of questions you put on the table. We applaud you for revisiting them in this provocative and fruitful way. I have now set a lovely, pleasant table for my colleague who has been to South Africa perhaps more than the one time I have been there. <laughs> he might polish the table there, but he's also just as likely to smash at least some of the cups and saucers and make quite a mess of my handiwork. <laughs> Whatever works for a good debate. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Appleby. Uh, thank you very much, Fani. Thank you for the book. Uh, thank you also for many years of contribution to reconciliation in South Africa and increasingly in other countries. Hello, everyone. By my count, there are eight South Africans in the audience, some of them at least, here permanently or semi permanently, which isn't a positive testimony to reconciliation in South Africa, is it? <laughs> and if there are eight South Africans in the audience, we have it least eight different perspectives on reconciliation in our country, as it should be. So I agree with a lot of what Fani has said, but I'll give a slightly different take. The Oxford Dictionary defines reconciliation as the restoration of friendship after a quarrel. And you can see how far that bland definition is from the complexity and difficulty and multifacetedness of reconciliation at the end of a civil war. So I think that it's helpful for us to break down this concept, to disaggregate reconciliation. I think the term in itself is just too loaded, it's too complex to capture everything that we're talking about. And I want to offer briefly a slightly more detailed typology than, than the one finally presented. And I think that helps us discern the different types of reconciliation, different dynamics, different goals, different obstacles, and <coughs> also different levels of progress. I think in South Africa, and this is no doubt true of other countries coming out of civil war, we can make progress in certain regards with respect to certain types of reconciliation more than with respect to other types of reconciliation. So I identify six different types of reconciliation, and this would be a typology not specific to South Africa. The first is political reconciliation, which is the deal reached by your political elite, the rivals, to shift their struggle from mortal enmity, wanting to kill each other, to be willing to cooperate and compete politically within the nonviolent rules of the game. 
But after that transition, you have no transition from war to peace, you have no to use government's term, you have no negative peace, and you have no potential for any other kind of reconciliation. In South Africa, we achieve this. So we get a full months political transition from war, political violence to a relatively stable democracy competing for power nonviolent. Why? Because, in part, as Fani said, our political leaders recognize their mutual interdependence, but also because they recognize, as you said, that they couldn't win, that none of the sides could win. They could continue the struggle almost indefinitely without a victor. And so they decided to call it off and settle for a draw since outright victory was under outright victory was under them. The second type of reconciliation flowed from that institutional reconciliation. We settled for a draw. No one side defeated the other, and that meant that the institutions of the state had to include both the old and the new. And this was a fraught, a very sensitive process, especially with respect to the security services. We had integration in the army, intelligence, and police, and all state departments of the new, the NC, and vestiges of the old apartheid order, all trying to cohabit the same space in institutions that were meant to govern us and provide for our well-being and security. And it was a tumultuous period for five to 10 years, but I think we achieved this institutional reconciliation because of the recognition of interdependence. We didn't have an alternative. Thirdly, we can talk about interpersonal reconciliation, and in my view, that's what the TRC was about. It was about the reconciliation between families and individuals who had been in the sharp end of apartheid, who had been forcibly removed from their homes, or had been tortured, or had done the torture, or had killed people in detention, or the families of those killed. Have we made progress? Who's to say? I mean, it's, it's just... There are too many people in society to really get a grip on what kind of interpersonal reconciliation has been achieved. Well, there is symbolic reconciliation. And the symbolic reconciliation emanated from political reconciliation, and this is the new anthem, the new sports team, and their and the new jerseys, their new names, it's the flag, um, it's the new insignia and uniforms of the security services, and it's sending a message. This is potent signaling. And I think it's we achieved this and it's been effective. The message is we are one nation, we are not a divided nation. And at this grand national symbolic level, I think the message is clear. Even if there are outposts of resistance. But fifth, and this is where the problem begins, or where the problem is currently, there is community reconciliation. And we have not achieved that in the slightest. So reconciliation at the community level is about the integration of previously divided groups, which in South Africa have a coincidence of race and color and, and class. In the community in which I live, for example, in Cape Town, community known as Harpe, we have a white middle class, upper class living behind high fences or fancy expensive security. We have South African terminology, a black African township, which is working class and unemployed, segregated, cut off, denied access to facilities. <coughs> and then we have an old, well established, traditional working class, very impoverished, colored or mixed, mixed race community that are not integrated. They are interdependent. And this is where I think the notion of interdependence breaks down. So I'm with you on interdependence to this point. The interdependence breaks down here because we are inter interdependent. Who are the gardeners of the white, wealthy elite? Who are their servants? It looks, if you walk into most of the homes in the community in which I live, it looks like apartheid South Africa. We are interdependent economically, but we are not in any way integrated. And the last kind of reconciliation, I'm calling societal reconciliation, which is community reconciliation at the grand national social level, where we are, have made very little progress, where we are still deeply segregated, notwithstanding our economic interdependence. 
I think the problem here is really a political choice that the ruling elite made in the first 10 years of our new democracy. And they had an intense tussle within the ruling party and its allies. And the tussle was essentially, are we going to pursue at the macroeconomic level a working class pro poor agenda or a middle class black nationalist aspiring black capital agenda? That was the debate that nearly tore the, a nearly tore the ANC apart and which was won by embedding the nationalists. So we have a fundamental cleavage today in South Africa between a ruling elite that comprises black nationalists, emergent black capital, and English capital, which is industrial and mining capital, on the one hand, and the vast majority of people who are poor, unemployed, living in crime-ridden areas. We are all interdependent, but the challenge of social and economic justice, inequality, equality and equity, we have failed signally to meet. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Clyde Mosman. I'm from South Africa. I'm a South African attorney and today at the Rhodes University. Um, I, I grew up in the 80s in South Africa, and uh, a lot of what you talk about resonates naturally. Um, and you're quite correct, um, as, as, as Mary just highlighted. Of the South Africans in the room, we all have different views. I have the view of a black South African. Which is very different. But let's start off with the discussion around Nelson Mandela. There's a book by Dr. Ampelo and Pele, Type of Main Goods Best. And she talks, she starts off the book talking about African tradition, where when there are spirits that haunt or torment a village or a society, there was a spiritual practice of going into this forbidden territory and calling them out by name. And so she talks about how we call them out by name in order to address and exorcise the society of these fiends. Of the discussions that have been had up to now, there was one critical aspect missing, and none of the speakers said it, and that is reconciliation and its relationship to truth. Because we talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Reconciliation does not, become, does not come before truth. It comes after. Um, I saw Nelson Mandela a few times in my life. The first time was when he came to what you referred to as, um, in 1992, in uh, a Shack Township. Um, there was Shelter, there was Bipato, the Bipato Massacre. That, the, the Ripato massacre that led to the breakdown of Kodesa One, the national. Ripato. Ripato, yes, I grew up in Shelter. And that was the first time I saw Nelson Mandela. And it was the contest between whether we proceed with Kodesa or not. And the people were saying no. And by the people, I mean the black South Africans were saying, we need to stop because there's a third force at play here. And that's when Nelson Mandela went and spoke on television. The second time was when the South African Constitution was signed into law in Sharpville. And the third time was in Nelson Mandela and his coffin. There's a sense when we talk about Nelson Mandela of this Nelson Mandela exceptionalism, <coughs> or what is called the Mandela exceptionalism. And when we talk about the, the legacy of Nelson Mandela or the, or the current situation in South Africa, we seem to consolidate all these divergent views under the one figure of Nelson Mandela. That's, in, that's very problematic. And I think it's convenient for the international community to think of South Africa under this unified, consolidated figure of a Nelson Mandela. Because as we know, there's a contested legacy right now. So I think of Nelson Mandela in two ways. I think of him in what he calls himself, a sinner who keeps on trying, as he used to refer to himself. But at the same time, I think of him as a tragic revolutionary. And the 
thought that comes to mind is Bertolt Brecht's poem, Poster Posterity, where he concludes the poem by saying, you who shall emerge from the flood, think when you speak of our weaknesses, but think also of the dark time which you will come. And I think that's what Nelson Mandela's life really tells us. We must think of the dark times that brought him and his generation. But, and I thank you for the key issues that you raised. You talk about whether South Africans have forgotten. I think white South Africa has forgotten, not black South Africa. And Professor Pumla Dola in South Africa talks about this notion of transgenerational trauma, right? That South Africans, black South Africans are currently going through because it is the enforced, the democracy of post party in South Africa has created the enforced sense of acceptance and forgetfulness because it is convenient to the narrative of South Africa. And as you rightly pointed out, what we're seeing right now both in the political structure of South Africa and our parliament, but also in the public domain, is a contested, is a contested terrain over the legacy of what South Africa is in the party. There's an international concept of what the international community would like to think South Africa is, but there is a truth, and again, I go back to the term that I said was missing. There's a truth that we as South Africans live with. And I think that term of transgenerational trauma is quite important because trauma is something that is embedded from within, it is within. And so one could somehow misconceive or, mis or, or, or not perceive properly as forgetfulness because it is so innate and so internal, a trauma. The next comment I just want to make is, you spoke about forgiveness. Um, and rightfully so, you spoke about the fact that F.W. de Klerk, former President F.W. de Klerk, who was representative of white South Africa, never asked for forgiveness. So here we have the collective identity of Nelson Mandela, who's seen as a spokesperson of black South Africa, and then F.W. de Klerk, who's seen as the progressive spokesperson of white South Africa, that never asked for forgiveness. Right? And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I make the link again here between Truth and Reconciliation, we, and I challenge your your argument, I have not had the pleasure of reading the book, unfortunately. And so some of my views are perhaps quite suspicious. I challenge the notion that we can have interdependence, and to some extent I agree with Professor Apple. POV, it's a very idealistic notion. One has to interrogate truth. And as we know, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission gave us four types of truth. It's in chapter five, volume one, page four. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission itself acknowledged what Professor Ignatiev said about truth. Professor Ignatiev said in the context of truth and reconciliation, truth is but the lessening of lies which can go unchallenged in the public discourse. And so there are four types of truth that the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission told us about. It's the factual and forensic truth, who did what, when, and to whom. Where are the bodies of our loved ones? Where are the bones of our loved ones? Yes. A large body of South Africans to this day still don't know. Because forgiveness has not been requested and so answers have not been given. Second, personal truth. That is something that is beyond, I suppose, control because it's how one views it subjectively. But the third is quite important, and I think perhaps interdependence speaks to this, is when we talk about social and or discourse, truth is the contested legacy of remembrance of past violations. Right? And the third part, and I think this speaks to, to what you're saying today, is the notion of healing and reconciliatory truth, which requires both parties to engage. But interdependence also presupposes equality in the engagement, mm -hmm. right? And we know the, the position in South Africa. We know the position. One can go and many can actually argue that we know who the winners are in the South African democracy. We know the constitution is said to be the consolidation, and I'm speaking as a lawyer and somehow quite subjectively here. The constitution is seen as a codification of guarantees of certain privileges. So I'm posing these to you. I, I know it's quite it's quite a large comment slash question. 
And so I'm asking whether your work engages with all or some of these aspects. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, the answer to all of the questions is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I want to thank, uh, if I see this, I want to thank both my respondents and also the questioners. Um, I see it as a huge compliment, the level of thoughtfulness that's gone into these, uh, these responses. Um, let, let me make one thing clear at the beginning of my response, which I tried to emphasize in the book, this idea of interdependence. I'm not... I'm speaking of it as a reality and a normativity. So I'm, I'm asking people to first of all acknowledge that they are in a relationship already. So economic interdependence, it exists. And for that very reason, the argument then becomes, now let's think of it morally and normatively, because it already exists. Because if you do not do that, um, popular wisdom is that you will you can benefit yourself in yes. group, but 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 actually, what I'm arguing is that if unless you're the person you're in a relationship with also prosper, the group also prosper, you will not prosper in the long term. Um, th th there is an interdependence in that future, uh, and 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 so you know um, one can debate that, but but I I would say that the uh, the South African um, constitution, for example, uh, does two things, not just one. It does codify uh, uh, current ownership patterns, but it also puts a very strong emphasis on redress. And so it's saying, and, and you know, the argument was that to retain the value of what is property in South Africa, you can't just scrap property rights. So, so, so I think the constitution, as it stands, is a is a good compromise. But um, I understand also the push for faster processes for land reform, and I, I support that. Um, Scott, it is a risky book. It is a risky book, uh, but I think that these were the genuine questions that came up into my mind as I read about reconciliation, and I thought. I had hoped that this could cut through a lot of this hot air that has been, you know, all exactly what you're quoting, the, the orthodoxy that has developed about the South African process. Um, and that it all came down to Nelson Mandela's good grace and, uh, and you know, that it was two, two, two focal points in South Africa. And it is Nelson Mandela and it's the TRC. For me, the core of our reconciliation process happened in between that. It happened in the more inglorious processes, which have not really been unpacked properly. So um, interdependence as a, as a fact opens a question for interdependence as a norm. So if we are interdependent, it means how, how should we be interdependent? And that is where my book does address justice and power differentials. And it says that um, the, two, the two criteria one should strive for in, in this process is inclusivity and fairness in the, in the relationship that, that, um, that is acknowledged. So the less that a, a relationship is inclusive or fair, the, le the further away you are from reconciliation, the more that becomes so a, a, a relationship that is acknowledged and then gradually transformed according to those norms is what I see reconciliation to be. But the, the, the selling point for reconciliation is that it already exists. These relationships do exist. They are in fact there. And if I have a gardener in my garden and I'm oppressing that gardener through, through an unfair wage, my arguments in the end of the day, at some point, it's going to catch up with me. Well, it's still in our time, but I suggest we take two more questions and uh, we'll conclude by that. Or actually, yeah. Thank you, Fanny. Uh, uh, an interesting uh, book, and I hope to read it. Um, 
um, you position yourself as you know a kind of in the middle ground between um, remnants of apartheid white nationalists and a very really vague left. I'm wondering whether you have, and this is one of the great lacuna in South African history, looked at any critics of the reconciliation, its entire process beyond the ANC, which doesn't, which didn't come about 25 years later, but happened at the time. For example, Deborah Alexander, who wrote a book, you know, not only Mandela's exceptionalism, but saying an ordinary country, right? Transition, issues in transition from, uh, were you able to reach that kind of literature and that kind of critique of reconciliation process? There's a chapter, chapter four, that deals with what I call difficult questions from the left. Not the so-called left, the left, which is different. In my talk, I spoke about the so-called left as those people who um, who use racial critique as a as a front for looting, uh, and th that is prevalent in South Africa. Not just racial critique, but also capitalist critique, for, uh, and it's a it's a it's a cheap appropriation of hard won insights from the left that are being appropriated by, by criminals. And, and I'm calling that the so-called left, but that does not take away the difficult questions from the real left, from the left, which I do deal with in, in, in the chapter. Um, well, I, looking I at- you, uh, um, which, which authors are you? Suinka, uh, Wally Suinka, Mandani, um, and, and people like that. Um, Have you ever heard of a guy called R.O. Dutton? Helen Keys? Yes. yes. Uh, do you have her? Yes. Okay. Look, that part of the history, you see, people yeah. think about that part of the history, the black consciousness movement, the Pan Africanist Congress, yeah. the Trotsky Act is completely absent. I mean, if, if, for example, if I ask people about it, they, know, they don't know these names. And those who have critiques, for example, Neville Alexander was a powerful critique, mm -hmm. spent 10 years on Robben Island, in fact, was a teacher to any of them. Of those who were on the island, that this is completely you know, gone, it needs to be recovered. Young people are now beginning to come that consciousness. I just have to also say, I don't claim to be a comprehensive book of yeah. all the critiques. That, that, that would not be beyond this book's scope. But, but thank you for that comment. I will certainly look at that. One last question. My, my question was actually similar. I mean, when I uh, you know, in my you know classes at Notre Dame with the, the Crockett Institute of students, when I present reconciliation and so forth, the critique I always get is, um, well, "This is very nice, but the part you haven't really addressed is the fundamental underlying you know, economic inequalities." And one could argue that that was you know, critical to what apartheid was. And, and I don't know; I haven't been following South Africa closely, but some make the critique that it's basically still there in terms of the inequalities. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe there's been more progress. And some also associate the uh, level of crime. The ones that, well, now the big problem is crime, but crime is very closely related to the inequalities. And it seems to me that was maybe the one big thing that was not really dealt with in that whole kind of stretch of time, say from 1990 to 2000, even, right? Other things were dealt with, you know, impartially and always imperfectly, but at least they made a stab at it. But the, economic part seems to me that that um, was maybe the big untended business, you know, and um, what would be the, I mean, can you talk to me at all, like what, what are ways to confront that now? Yeah, I mean, you know, the assumption is that somehow you can change the economy like this, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, I, I'm still looking for a country that's done that. I mean, maybe Germany, some sort of East Germany, West Germany, I don't know, but I'm not an economist, but it's a difficult one to, to um, I mean, the critique is easy. Coming up with the alternative is not so easy. Um, I, I would say though, uh, Dan, that um, I think that um, in the South African case, it, we, we uh, 
what is happening now. So um, Zuma was, and this is the question, can, could our democracy survive a really bad president? And we're finding out now whether that is possible. Um, my, my take at the moment is that our institutions, our democratic institutions, have survived. In fact, they got rid of that president. Uh, it's, no, it's no longer there. And, um, there are three things now under the new president that are the three national priorities that he has taken on. Number one is a very, very strenuous anti-corruption drive which have got a public commission sitting that is very similar to the TRC, actually. People come and testify to this commission called the Zondo Commission. And um, I mean, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but a number, more than 10 ministers have been fined. Um, definitely more than 10 of the so-called parastatal executives have been fined. There is a very strong push to get to the bottom of corruption uh, and, to, and to eradicate that root evil. The second one is land reform. The second big focus at the moment in South Africa is land reform. We have a very extended public process around land reform. And um, this is where the constitution uh, is being, uh, there's, there's, uh, I don't think they will in the end change the constitution, but there's a, expropriation without compensation clause that they want to insert into the law. It won't make much of a difference. The, the, the issue is there hasn't been political will up till now. And now it seems there is beginning to be. So land reform as a symbolic redress measure. And the third one that's on the table is growing the economy. Because all of this means nothing if there isn't if there isn't more money on the table. And the president has set a target of a hundred billion and he's at 35. He's, 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 he's going around with his baking bowl around the world. So are we busy with what we should be busy with? I think we are, in, we are regaining our focus. Uh, but we have a terrible uh, legacy to overcome now, which played into our previous legacy, um, uh, you know, enhanced the apartheid structures as, as they were. Uh, my biggest worry uh, right now for us the thing we have to fight against is the quality of life on the other side of the line from where I'm sitting. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, and lots of us have evolved in different ways, but it's unacceptable how life is treated uh, on that side, on, on, on that area. Um, uh, and that is simply what needs to change. That will be the outcome of inclusive and a fair society. Then we would have ta taken interdependence from a de facto reality into a normative legal space if we'd managed that. I think it's a 25 year project. I don't think we must think of it before then. Thank you very much, Fanny, for providing <laughs>